Good day. My name is Jimmy Edgerton, and I am with the Heart Hospital Baylor Plano and also the Texas Quality Initiative. And we're here to present a roundtable to you today on the STS's new guidelines on atrial fibrillation. From time to time, our society will convene a panel and a committee of experts in a field to review the literature in detail and then to help our membership in making guidelines directed decisions in the care of their patients, we will produce a document that contains recommendations. Not only recommendations, but they are staged in class of recommendation for how strong they are and how, how weak they are. And then we will back that up with a level of evidence that supports that recommendation. That's the guideline process. I have a distinguished panel with me today, all of whom are thought leaders in the area of treatment of atrial fibrillation, and members, all members of the writing committee for the new Society of Thoracic Surgeons guidelines on atrial fibrillation. To my right is Dr. Vinay Badwar, and he chaired this effort. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery at West Virginia University. To my left is Dr. Neve, uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Neve Ad who's also professor of cardiac surgery at West Virginia University. And on my far left, Dr. Richard Sheeman, chief of cardiac surgery and vice chair of the Department of Cardiac Surgery at UCLA. Now, I want to start today with Dr. Badwar, who chaired this initiative. So Dr. Badwar, this is the first such Society of Thoracic Surgery's guideline statement on the treatment, surgical treatment of atrial fibrillation. So tell us, since there hasn't been one in the past, why now? What prompted us to move now? Also, what's new here, and how does this differ from other guideline statements that's, that exist from the American College of Cardiology and the Heart Rhythm Society and so forth? Well, I think um, in the literature right now, there is essentially only, uh, prior to this effort, there was only one guideline that had a reference to surgical ablation uh, for atrial fibrillation and that was the effort in the, by the Heart Rhythm Society, which was done also in collaboration with the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Um, however, in that uh, guideline effort, uh, they used and referenced the literature uh, essentially from the late 1990s and early 2000s, where the knowledge base of surgical ablation was still in development. But since that effort, uh, which essentially described surgical ablation as a one pot in that if you're doing cardiac surgery, do an ablation if there's atrial fibrillation, which was their summary guideline. And, su and basically sum summated all cardiac surgery as one. But since that time, uh, a, a copious amounts of literature um, has permeated the, the, um, the globe, essentially, on experience with surgical ablation. And so this effort was to coalesce the most contemporary literature and make recommendations by essentially um, separating surgery into separate compartments, similar to what we would do as surgeons. In other words, into isolated mitral operations, isolated coronary bypass grafting operations, aortic valve operations, and standalone operations. And there is a, a, a fair number of randomized control trials, meta-analyses, um, uh, some of which you've all written, and uh, we coalesce those to make these recommendations. And the summary is that we were able to follow um, the, the rigorous process to come up with the recommendations, uh, essentially that in isolated mitral operations, when one has atrial fibrillation, that we now can safely recommend a class one, in other words, it's recommended, level of evidence A, which essentially is randomized control trials and metal analyses to do surgical ablation. In coronary bypass grafting operations, it is a class one level of evidence B, randomized, and, sorry, non-randomized. And this is um, a recommendation to do ablation at the time of cabbage. And in AVR operations, that it's also a, a class one level of evidence B. So these are important recommendations that the literature has borne out that we're now helping surgeons um, with an approach to treating atrial fibrillation at the time of surgery. So it's safe to say then that 
these class one recommendations are the strongest recommendations we have. Benefit far exceeds the risk, and the level of evidence A and B is means they're highly supported by the evidence in the literature. Correct. Despite that, we know that today of patients who are going to the operating room with atrial fibrillation and the intent is to do a mitral valve operation, just over 60% of them receive a surgical ablation. For the same population going for an aortic valve who have atrial fibrillation, 39% of those receive a surgical ablation concomitant to their aortic valve. The numbers for coronary artery bypass grafting are that 33% receive the surgical ablation despite them having a level one indication. Among the reasons given for this, Dr. Ad, at, at uh, previous surveys, among the reasons surgeons give is that performing a concomitant ablation adds too much risk, that the results aren't consistent. You've published in this area, so tell me, are these valid concerns, or is it time for surgeons to change their behavior? Well, um, thank you uh, uh, for the question. It's a, it's a great privilege to be here. I think it's an important uh, discussion. Um, you know, um, a few years ago, if you would ask me this question, I would definitely agree with you that uh, there is more to be done in order to have more surgeons doing the procedure by supporting them uh, one way or the other. But through our extensive work uh, uh, the past decade, um, I came um, into a different conclusion, uh, which actually is going to lead, I think, to the same thing. There is a, a significant issue in the perception of the significance of atrial fibrillation on one hand, uh, and I will get to it in a second. And, and the second issue, which is important, is that we are all measured by 30 days outcome. <coughs> um, so when it comes to AFib, um, really we don't have good evidence long term beyond the year, except for uh, several centers throughout the world, to justify, so to speak, uh, an intervention when it comes to mortality benefits and, uh, and, uh, and stroke benefits and to mirror and, and su su supplement uh, or, or combine these STS guidelines. We have an AATS guidelines that are coming out in the next few weeks that actually focused on those outcomes. Unfortunately, most of the RCT trials, if not all of them, stop the follow-up at one year. So there is a, a gap in evidence uh, what happens beyond, you know, 30 days really. So that's, I think, something for us to work in the future. And, and the second problem is that atrial fibrillation or the <coughs> impact of surgery for atrial fibrillation is not being measured in 30 days. So the perception of increasing mortality and morbidity and sh look bad and when it comes to public reportings or, or STS results and so on and so forth, although as we know it's not as simple as I just said, I think uh, uh, is a big stumble stumbling stone when it comes to implementation. On top of those two issues that are important, there is lack of integrity and leveling with the playing field across the U.S., especially with training and knowledge base of surgeon of AFib when it comes to uh, what's the importance, what lesion set, and as important, if not the most important, what type of energy sources to be used and when. So I think if we can, in the <coughs> next five years, resolve some of those issues, uh, we will have much more uh, problem-oriented approach to the, to the, uh, to the AF surgery uh, when it comes to the singular surgeon doing surgery uh, in a place uh, somewhere in the U.S. Thank you for that very insightful answer. But let me come down to a practical day-to-day -day question. What do you say to the surgeon that says, yes, you may have that recommendation to do a concomitant ablation for that patient when I'm doing his primary procedure, but that just adds too much risk for my patient. Is that true? No, I think it was never shown to be like this, even with the full cut and sew maze. <coughs> but, uh, but you know, uh, myths are developed, and uh, um, as a human beings, we always try to explain our, you know, downfalls with some other evidence that not necessarily exists. And as we know, throughout the cardiovascular world, when you look at guidelines, the, 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 the amount of true evidence or the relative true evidence with level A and, and class one recommendation 
uh, going back to the famous JAMA paper from 2002, it's, it's relatively low. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an education it's an education process. There are certain patients that I, even I would not do an AFib ablation on, but the general everyday patient that have atrial fibrillation, <coughs> even with reduced cell function and multiple valves and so on and so forth, there is no evidence whatsoever that's based on true uh, study that uh, follows some uh, basic scientific uh, values that show that, that, that we are hurting the patient. There's the issue with pacemakers that we can, if we have time, we, we, can, we can talk about, but I think this is another myth. And it, it depends on the level of, of proficiency and how, uh, uh, how do you, as a surgeon, pay attention to details when it comes to right atrial lesion set. So I think, um, I think what you raise is the key point, but there is, there is really not evidence to support uh, 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 that we are hurting the patient. And actually, if we go back to the wonderful paper that was presented yesterday, uh, uh, the Clark paper actually shows that doing surgery is very beneficial even in 30 days when it comes to mortality and major mobility and mortality. Uh, so I think, uh, I think uh, this is uh, something for us to work and uh, to send a message out. Thank you. In fact, as you say, the evidence is emerging that performing a concomitant ablation in the appropriate patient category actually increases their long-term survival. And all these things come together to support these class one recommendations. So Dr. Scheman, there is this significant treatment gap then that exists. You're an experienced thought leader in this field, an experienced educator and a leader throughout our STS society. So reflecting back Previously, when the efficacy of new treatments has become apparent, such as the use of, mitral, of the internal mammary for coronary artery bypass grafting, techniques for mitral valve repair rather than replacement, surgeons have risen to the occasion. They've learned these techniques and altered their behavior. But we have this treatment gap that exists now. How do we catalyze this change in our treatment paradigm so that surgeons adopt these techniques of doing concomitant surgical ablation in the appropriate patient categories. How do we make this happen? Well, that's a very important key question. There's no doubt that I believe that the development of guidelines helps in the education of the surgical community as well as the medical community of what is the evidence. And a panel of experts have deliberated and come to a variety of conclusions based upon that evidence. I will be a little bit critical that when surgeons from two different societies don't write guidelines together, we run the risk of not necessarily coming up with similar conclusions. So I think that a consistent message is very important. And if, even if taking into based on the evidence in an ideal world, wouldn't the conclusions come up the same? Well, I think we know that experts sitting around the table weigh evidence in a different way, and that's why these are guidelines and not necessarily absolute prescriptions of how we do things. That's why it's a guideline. Exactly. Now, the real issue is that dissemination of this information. And the fact that it has been packaged in a way so that people can review that literature to see how these conclusions have been made is very important. So dissemination of these guidelines is step one. Step two, every surgeon should walk into the operating room with a skill set that allows them to confidently perform an AFib ablation. And I think Dr. Ad has made a very good point. You have to understand not only technology, techniques, application of those techniques, lesion sets, and very often in concomitant AFib surgery, the surgeon's mindset is the valve, the coronary bypass, and not necessarily the ablation. So we have to change our perception that we need to apply 
all the knowledge we have and the best technologies we have to hopefully get the best efficacy. And Dr. Ann makes a very good point also in that there's very few studies that study patients out to the one year mark, which probably should be the minimum to look at efficacy. Because most of our databases limit us to 30 day outcome and that's clearly inadequate for AFib outcomes. So I think to deal with the gap, we need to te teach surgeons the technology, the techniques, and how to do this operation so there's no psychological barrier. We need to teach them that the mindset that if you do a concomitant AFib ablation, that is just as important as inserting a heart valve or doing a coronary bypass from technical expertise. And finally, we need to teach them how to follow their patients. In other words, very often we know how to follow our patients that have ischemic heart disease and valvular heart disease. But if you really want to know your results, you need to partner probably with one of your electrophysiology colleagues so that you really get the follow-up to know whether or not you're producing the standard of care that we're all looking for. And as we move in that direction, I think we'll solve the problem of the knowledge gaps, the application gaps. But the final thing is that there's always the judgment. There are times you need to know when not to do something, but it shouldn't be because you're afraid of working inside the atrium that you don't, don't understand the technology and you don't know how to perform the techniques. Thank you, Dr. Sheeman, well stated. As I often like to say, surgeons increasingly need to adopt the mindset of moving into the area of disease management rather than being proceduralists. We have just very little bit of time left, but Dr. Badwar, I want to come back to you. Um, let me ask you this. There's been some controversy in both the surgical and the electrophysiological community about how aggressively concomitant ablation should be applied to surgical patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, how would you respond? I would respond in the process. And let me pre-state that as w was eloquently stated in this roundtable already that we have some facts that are coming out on the risk of not doing a surgical ablation and someone coming to the operating room just to fuse mitral disease for an example for a mitral valve operation that has atrial fibrillation as Dr. Ad stated in the Clark paper presented in, in the January session here at the SDS showed that we actually have mortality can be reduced if you add a surgical ablation. So that's just 30 days. And we also have facts looking at long-term outcomes of survival when a surgical ablation is, is made. But with this piece of knowledge known, that's not why we did the guidelines. That's not the process in how we created guidelines. Guidelines followed the Institute of Medicine rigor that is consistent with every other international guideline process that exists in the literature. This was not bias. We had to check all of our personal, it had to be completely transparent so that we couldn't bring bias to the table. And this was a process called the Delphi Consensus Process where we reviewed over 400 articles and a team of people knowledgeable in the fa of this literature weighed all of these, and this is a process that took two years. This wasn't a flippant kind of, hey, I think it should be this. This checked all biases, and there was a very rigorous voting process, just like every other guideline in the literature, which is why guidelines take their painstaking processes. And therefore, this followed directly that process, and that's why there's so much strength in these guidelines. Um, and that being said, <clears throat> We've also enjoyed a, a great collaboration with other societies, and you've, uh, you and I have participated in the HRS process, which is in process now. But you know, I think there is wide acceptance of these guidelines, and even on our EP side, and our EP friends have um, uh, agreed to this process. And I think it'll be a 
um, a, a wider uh, acceptance once the HRS guidelines come out that are also reflective of the STS guidelines. So I think we're going to have a new day in how we think about atrial fibrillation, how we think about surgical ablation and its role in the treatment paradigm when patients present to the OR uh, with atrial fibrillation or for standalone cases. Thank you. One final comment. And I want to say that I feel that for surgeons doing atrial fibrillation work, the heart team approach that is becoming so well adopted and in other areas of cardiovascular medicine works very well in this particular area. And also, I think that every single practice should have a champion for AFib. Not every surgeon necessarily needs to know everything, but we work in teams and always learning from each other in our individual practices can be a very good way to narrow that gap, both in technology and technique. So Dr. Sheehan brings up a great closing comment to add, add to yours about the heart team approach. And uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we were all part of the committee, guidelines committee and, and the writing uh, uh, committee for this. But summarized for our audience, did we consider the heart team approach? Absolutely. It's, it's actually in the guidelines. It's and in the so, guidelines. Um, you know, this, this level of evidence C, because we don't have evidence to support it, but that is, uh, is, is definitely an important aspect. Uh, as you noted, and as uh, Dr. Ad has published widely on, uh, this is a, a, a team approach. Um, and like you also noted, that having, you know, one or two um, surgeons knowledgeable in the art, so to speak, um, much like you know, we're talking about coronary heart teams and mitral heart teams and aortic valve heart teams, TAVR teams, uh, that atrial fibrillation therapy should be among them. However, the way technique has evolved, I think there is a level of safety and um, uh, surgeons can learn this without harming patients, without risk. Um, there, there's risk for anything, but the literature is becoming um, far more robust in supporting the safety aspects. So I think many surgeons should do this just as if you came to the OR with degenerative disease and you had a simple P2 resection, we all know that that should be repaired and surgeons can do that. And also heart teams not only help in patient selection and patient follow-up <coughs> and institutional ability to look at their own individual outcomes and benchmark them against national outcomes, but also leads to new concepts, hybrid approaches so we are a, at a point in time, we can't be sure that if we do this again in five years, that there may be new techniques and new technologies that advance the field, new ways to get better outcomes, less invasive techniques. So we have a guideline that is on the best evidence to date, and then I'm sure we're going to evolve over time. So. Just one, one more uh, quick comment because I think uh, Richard brought a, a point that some of the listeners may take uh, um, uh, maybe the wrong way, although it's a very good point. We have the first surgical guidelines for atrial fibrillation surgery were done by ISMIX in 2009. It's a well thought uh, process. And then the STS ones and the AATS to come are actually complementary of each other. Despite the fact that they were done by different societies, because of different decision process and uh, unawareness of the process in each society, we tried very hard to coordinate and have those two documents supplement each other. So when you read the STS on one end and the AATS on the other hand, it there will be complementary on each other. And just to, on, on, on the STS side, we will put a lot of effort on the, on the, on the heart team approach. At the AATS side, we put a lot of emphasis on the technology that is adequate, or more importantly, the, the one that is not adequate. And for the first time, we're putting guidelines, uh, a very clear recommendation for training and proficiency of surgeons. And I think if, if when we move forward, the next guidelines will be probably uh, together, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we can build on, on it to, uh, to, to evolve the field and, 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 and and, and have uh, more surgeons doing uh, good work in the field. Thank you. I want to uh, <clears throat> thank my distinguished panelists, all thought leaders, all participating in this 
development of this guideline statement. <clears throat> its intent is to benefit our patients by helping you in making evidence-based decision on the treatment of your patients. Now, I want to thank the Society of Thoracic Surgeons who supported not only this rigorous and long process, but also this roundtable today, and I want to thank you for listening.